very shortly. So if you just bear with us, um, by all means, if you want to raise anything, you can raise it in the Q&A. So the session today is going to be on, on open science policies and the roadmaps. And we're going to have a number of talks um, from different panelists looking at international perspectives on that. So from, from Peggy O.T. Boteng from UNESCO, from Kazu Yamajai from the National Institute of Informatics, from Ongan Prinat, from GRNet, and from Pam Abbott um, from the University of Sheffield Information School. So we'll have those four talks and some discussion, and then we're going to move on to a number of lightning talks about the LibCenter National Open Science Roadmaps. So we're just waiting on our first speaker. So we'll just give a couple of minutes for Peggy to come in. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll move on to the next part of the agenda um, and come back to that um, first talk. Okay. And I'm conscious I probably should have introduced myself as well. I don't know all of you, so I'm, I'm Sarah Jones. I work at Géant, the network provider in, in Europe. Um, we work closely um, with colleagues in other continents, so certainly with OMO and colleagues at WACRA, and, and are delighted to be here and part of the conference. And my background, I've done a fair amount in open science, specifically in the European context, working on the EOSC, um, so building the infrastructure and services to share data across Europe. So I think a lot of what we've done is relevant and hopefully there are some lessons learned we can share from our perspective as well. So. Thank you, Sarah, it's nice to meet, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you all too. So what I think I'll do, um, I'm going to start with the housekeeping um, and hopefully in the meantime, uh, Peggy will come in. And if not, um, Kazu, if you could be prepared, we'll maybe jump straight to your talk. So I will just share my screen. So I suspect some of you have been at sessions already, so you may be familiar with some of this, but I just wanted to run through some of the basic housekeeping on how the platform works. So you will see um, there's a speaker icon that you can tap in the top left corner um, to turn off your device's speaker. Um, you can mute and unmute. Ideally, everyone would stay um, muted while we're presenting, also because we're recording so we don't get too much background noise or echo. Um, but you can also speak out. Um, you can put questions in the Q&A and, and if you would like, I can bring, um, bring it to you to speak out and ask your question. There is a raise hand option that you can use and that will let me know that you want to ask a question directly. And um, please do remember to lower it after you've, after you've asked your question so that we can keep track. And there is a Q&A option and ideally this is where most of the questions would come in, um, but I will also monitor the chat so you can, you can use the two options. And you'll see if the host or any of the panelists reply via the Q&A window, you will also see the answer there. So that's ideally the way we'd run the, the questions and answers. Um, it's great that we have language interpretation in the webinar. You will see um, the icon so you can change to a different language if that's preferable to you. I would ask all of the speakers to speak slowly because things will be translated simultaneously. So just to make it easy on those translators, if you could take a little bit of time over the enunciation. And the session that we have today is about open science policy and roadmaps. We're going to hear from the panelists about different international experiences. And then we're going to have a number of lightning talks about the LibCenza National Open Science Roadmaps. And the key aim is to share experience, see what we can learn from one another and to support each other to advance that work. So without further ado, um, I will stop this and come back. Let's have a quick see. I don't see Peggy yet. Um, so, Kazu, if you're happy to begin, we'll take a look at open science initiatives in Japan. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Okay, so um, do you have a translation from the Japanese to the English or French? 
I think it's just English and French translation. Don't try try Japanese. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so, um, um, my name is Kaz. I am from National Institute of Informatics, Japan. So uh, I'd like to uh, explain our uh, the current um, the activities around the Open Science Initiative in Japan. So, um, as you may know, uh, my institution uh, is a the kind of the uh, the NLEN National Research and Education Network. It's a kind uh, like a similar body like uh, the WACLEN in your region. But um, in our case, we are Jap just supporting the Japanese uh, one single countries. So um, and my institution NII provides the high speed network backbone uh, throughout Japan. And on top of the network, we have a security service and uh, cloud service and identity federation service. And um, based on this kind of um, cloud service, uh, right now uh, we are developing the NII research data cloud, which is composed by the three uh, different uh, the parts. And in case of the publication on this part and on the discovery platform, we have already have a the services, but just focusing on the uh, JANA article on dissertation and a book. We are extending these kind of functionalities into the research data as well. And um, on the other hand, um, to support the, the full uh, requirement in terms of the, the research data life cycle uh, by our service, we decided to develop the Gakuni RDM, uh, which covers the research data management of ongoing research. And now we've started production level operation from the, the last month, um, which supports the daytime and move to the full support, uh, I mean, 24 hours and 365 days uh, from the April. And relationship, um, to meet the, the requirement um, and the needs from the, the institutional users. Uh, we also have um, communities like uh, LibSense uh, in your region. So um, uh, on the left hand side, uh, we have a community named Axis. And this is a kind of the edu course in the United States like organization in Japan. And mainly it is a community built by the University IT Center. And they have this uh, special interest group, which is strongly related to our service and uh, cooperate each other. For instance, uh, SIG RDM, uh, they are recently publicized a report named um, Principle of the University RDM. And now they are trying to write a more specific policy guidelines. And on the other hand, um, I denoted on the right hand side, the JP core is a, this is a, the community like a LibSense. So um, they are, um, they have a community, um, they are active, um, they have activity uh, in the field of the open science, uh, open science and open access repositories. And it has uh, this kind of a working group and communicate, um, communicating from the different angle from the, the IT center. And in case of the repository cloud service, um, named Jairo Cloud. We started this service in 2020 and based on the request from the middle and the small class universities and uh, we developed the repository uh, software named Weco and uh, hosting service on behalf of the universities. And um, by this service, university can focus on the, the contents deposit itself. The main role of the JP Core, I mean a community of the repository, uh, uh, their main role is a community support. And uh, they help each other by using the forum and the mailing list, uh, like uh, LibSense, and uh, to reflect their needs to our new development of our repository system. Uh, they are operating the, the survey by uh, for gathering the voice from the users and they decide the priority and how to develop the new functionality um, and deploy to our service. And after the development, um, they join to the testing if necessary, and we improve it. And they regularly are operating the training course for open access activities and the repository management. And of course, these support reduce the total cost of the Jail Cloud operation. For instance, by this support, we can um, provide the one instance to the small university by 400 US dollars per year. This is a very uh, cheap cloud service. 
So sorry to interrupt, um, Kazu. If you could slow down slightly for the interpreters, that would be really helpful. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's it's really hard to to do. Okay, and this graph shows the number of the institutional repositories in Japan, and the blue shows the number of the institution that operates the repository by the on-premise service. And orange and gray shows the number of the institution um, by using the Jail Cloud, our cloud service. And the more than 650 institutions in Japan are now using our cloud service. And from the 2015, uh, we've started to accept the migration from the on-premise to our Jail Cloud service. And then the gradually, the blue bar is now decreasing like this. And this is our experience in a repository cloud service. And in case of the new RDM research data management platform, we don't have to do the similar things. So we can would like to provide our new service um, from the, the cloud service, um, uh, born cloud service, the originally by the cloud service. And our RDM service is based on the open science framework. Uh, which was developed by the Center for Open Science in the United States. And this service can manage the research data by the research project and can connect to different type of the uh, existing uh, research tools, of course, including the cloud storage. And as our service deployment, uh, we are asking to the university to prepare their institutional storage and um, connect to our Gakuni RDM. And different from the the Jail Cloud, uh, this institution will start to operate or uh, provide the institutional research data management service originally by using our cloud service. And on top of the basic functionalities of the Open Science Framework and our Gakuni RDM, um, uh, we are right now developing the new component for data analysis, and this component intended to utilize the effective use of the existing computing resources over the Japan and to enhance the reproducibility of the research outcome. And um, another new aspect is for the data governance. Um, this component tries to support the research data management from the viewpoint of the DMP as a living document. And our DMP is not for the funding agency, but for formulate or orchestrate our NII research data cloud and to support the project management. And not only on uh, supporting the Japanese communities, um, but uh, we are also collaborating with um, Asian countries like this. And uh, some of the Malaysian universities are testing our Gakuni RDM. And uh, our new repository system, we got three, was employed by the Myanmar National Repository. Uh, although they are, the current situation seems to be very hard, but um, we are we cannot do this right now. This kind, you know, the training course. But um, we still would like to try to support their open access activities. And not only the Asian countries, um, I mean, is to come over there um, in the African countries. So the next time next year, I'll be there. And um, the EOSC, um, the European Open Science Cloud, has um, the good document which tells about how to process the interoperability. So um, there are different kind of the uh, interoperabilities uh, as has been uh, written here. So if I uh, look at a similarity between our NI Research Data Cloud and the Open Science, uh, European Open Science Cloud, and there are so many similarities like this. So and me and the Salah is now looking for how to collaborate each other between the GN and the NIR in terms in terms of the open science infrastructure. So not only us, uh, we, we would like to extend this kind of you know the communication or collaboration um of course um with the African countries. So um we I'd like to you know the share or discuss about this kind of aspect in uh, the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kazu. Um, so there was actually one direct question for you, um, which it might be worth taking just now, asking how can others benefit from the services that you've been developing? So um, uh, there are so many different types of, the, you know, uh, the angle. 
so um if i um think about a on the african countries so, um not only the african countries you know um so when i started a the repository cloud service so of course before that um before that the university they operate the repository service by their own effort but in case of the especially in case of the research data management the functionalities and the service becomes more complicated so it's so hard to operate that kind of service by the single institution so so there is a uh, you know strong benefit to tie each other you know um as nln or um uh, you know, um, connecting the, the university effort. Um, and then, you know, on behalf of that, there are so many things we can do uh, for them. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. I think it's a very inspiring as well, the, the RDM service you're offering and the uh, DMPs and, and also the hosting of repositories and the change you're seeing there. It's making it much more efficient, really, to be doing that centrally. There are a couple of questions um, about the sharing of the content from the session. Um, Omo can hopefully confirm this, but I'm sure everything will go up on the conference website, all the um, presentations and details from the session. So you will get access to the slides if you want to review. And everything is also being recorded. So I, I assume those recordings will also be made available. Okay, so. What we'll come on to next um, is looking at um, the National Initiatives for Open Science in Europe. And we're going to have um, Dr. Ongen Prundat from GRNet speak to us about the NIFOS project. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning to everybody. Um, yes, I mean, uh, it's project-based presentation, but uh, still it is uh, uh, trying to get a bigger picture, not just a particular, um, particular project. So I'll start. See my slides. All good. I think you can see the slide. Is correct? Uh, I'm still seeing a black screen, um, so I think it's still just loading. Ah, uh, there it's come up now. It's just in the ordinary view, okay. but if you flick it into full screen. Yeah, yeah. All right, here we are. So, um, national initiatives for open science in Europe, and it links into the previous talk nicely, I think, because Professor Kazu has mentioned the European Open Science Cloud and some issues of interoperability between EOSC and the, and the Japanese infrastructures. So um, just to give one uh, flash picture of EOSC here, this is a quote from the uh, European uh, Communication from the European Commission. So the, the vision of EOSC here is to to provide 1.7 million European researchers and 70 million professionals in science and technology in a virtual environment with free at the point of use, open and seamless services for storage management, analysis and reuse of research data across borders and scientific disciplines. So you can just imagine it as a free market or a hub access towards a free market of uh, different scientific resources and services and data repositories. Um, this is the, the long-term vision of the Commission. It's a, it's a very strong initiative. Um, uh, there has been a lot of investment in it already, and there will be uh, more coming up in the future. Uh, the questions there, which are relevant also somehow in the, from the context of, in the context of, of African um, situation, is, uh, the question is how to engage the generic service providers, so the providers which provide generic services for research, thematic providers, repository operators, data providers, and finally, of course, uh, scientists and researchers, to engage them to provide their services, to publish their data into European Open Science Cloud, to take the data from there, to process it, make publications based on their research, and again, publish it back into the cloud. So it's the, the question of engagement of different actors, and it's also a question of geographical coverage, uh, including the, the less developed regions. So the commission has uh, is funding four uh, separate projects covering, let's say, the territory of Europe. Uh, this is EOSC Pillar, EOSC Synergy, EOSC Nordic and uh, NIFOS Europe, a particular project that, that I'm going to be speaking about here. So trying to, to geographically cover this extent of Europe uh, and many countries that they are there in order to engage their um, stakeholders and actors in those countries uh, in the common endeavor of European Open Science Cloud. So the NIFOS Europe project covers uh, 15 countries uh, and there are 22 partners. So you can see the geographical uh, snapshot here. So it's Southeast Europe, uh, Western Balkans, uh, and uh, Caucasus countries, uh, which are engaged together in this endeavor. Uh, what I want to point out, what is really important that we have in this uh, consortium, uh, joined the forces between the open science communities and infrastructures and 
operators for services and um, uh, research, for research and technology, basically NRNs and computing centers. So the role of the NRN here, also in the context of Wacron, I can say that it's central in order to bring together the, the service providers on one side and then also the open science communities and infrastructures on the other. And the, the way that we have built the consortium to achieve our goals is to, to, to marry these two worlds. So his, here is the list of, of the partners. I will not get into the detail. It's coordinated by GRNet, Greek Research and Technology Network, which is the, the Greek NRN and uh, compute, cloud data center and also supercomputing center. Um, so the, the aims of, of this endeavor is to support the development and inclusion of national open science cloud initiatives in 15 member states and associated countries and to link them to EOSC governance, uh, to spread the EOSC and FAIR principles in the community and train it, and then provide the technical and policy support for onboarding different types of services uh, that I mentioned already into European open science cloud. So we have like a policy uh, or organizational aspect of organizing national initiatives. Uh, we have uh, an engagement aspect of spreading else and fair principles in the community. And then finally, a technical aspect of joining up uh, the, uh, the, the actual services into EOSC. Uh, so the first thing we did and uh, our um, recommendation is also that uh, this is, could be a good uh, point to start for, for Western and Central Africa as well. We have carried out the most extensive attempt to capture the open science in the region. Uh, we draft a comprehensive questionnaire. We have spread it through the community in these 15 countries and uh, contacted more than a thousand uh, uh, potential targets for the for the survey, and we have received uh, 575 responses. So, based on this, we have uh, we have created a map of let's say open science state of the art in the in the region, which is available in the link that you see here, um, and. Uh, through linking through this, uh, you can see different aspects of open science uh, uh, situation in the region. So this was a really good first step. And then uh, based on this, uh, we're now trying to bring these actors in, in each country together around the table to, to form within each country national open science cloud initiative. So the idea is to bring uh, a coalition, form a coalition of national stakeholders with prominent role and interest in EOS, bring them together and promote synergies at the national level and then uh, bring them um, in such a way that they form um, a, a, a strong collaboration on the national level and be able to then um, vocalize their collaboration also on the European and on the international, wider international level. Yeah? So forming the national open science initiatives is a, a very important uh, aspect. The, the uh, NRNs uh, such as uh, the members of WACRIN uh, also can play a strong role uh, there if this kind of grouping is done also in, in, in your region. So we have different ways inside the top, top down. So central decision by ministry to start an open science initiative in the country or bottom up where the researchers, uh, service providers, different stakeholders in the country get together and build the initiative uh, bottom up. Or you have a hybrid approach where there is a cooperation uh, between the government and the long term version of the government and also the interest of the researchers in the bottom up. Uh, so we have a very importantly issued a blueprint of how to form these national open science initiatives, how to bring the, the stakeholders together. And you can see here in the box on top uh, bottom right, uh, a link to uh, this document, which I think could be very useful also for our friends from, from, from the region uh, to have a look how things can be um, articulated and, and brought together on the national level. Um, these are now, I will not go into the detail, this blueprint has different steps of how to bring people together to collaborate and what are the forms of cooperation that you can establish on the national level. Um, this all is available in the link and due to the time limitations, I will not go into this here. Yeah? This is the uh, blueprint for national open science uh, initiatives. Now, the second very important aspect is uh, how to bring um, into the, the this um, this. Uh, initiative, the, the actual services. Yeah, These services could be uh, cloud the data centers, the virtual machines, uh, storage. They could be HPC resources. Uh, these services could be um, uh, data management services such as archival, generic repositories, data discoveries, Hadoop on demand, uh, uh, all types of data management services, which are generic. Yeah? So uh, we are looking into our, in our region to bring uh, a number of these kind of uh, services which are now active on the national level, serving the national communities into a wider ELSC in order to be available to all uh, European researchers. 
So apart from these generic services, then also have thematic services. We saw these as discipline specific services dealing with providing a particular service for, for a particular discipline. So uh, these are some examples on this slide here showing the ChemBio server, which is a service for filtering, clustering, and visualization of chemical compounds used in drug discovery. Uh, we have uh, different digital cultural repositories, uh, which would be integrated tools for, for visualization, um, different uh, climate applications with climate, uh, certain climate data, and so on and so forth. So these we refer to as thematic services. Uh, and now looking for uh, looking at the, the, the aspect of engagement, this is very important on the national and also on the regional and then finally on the European level from, from our European perspective. Uh, so ensuring the take up of core health services in the community, promoting uh, principles of fair data among research communities, engaging the scientific communities through targeted demonstrators, which use all these services that I described. Uh, and of course, uh, training and uh, general dissemination is very important. Uh, so specifically regarding um, a training, we do have a training platform. There is a link for a training platform at the bottom of this slide where you can find um, uh, different things, um, uh, material related to, to ELSC and FAIR, um, different training courses. Yeah, And also uh, what we have found very useful, and this is also something that can be considered uh, in, the, uh, in Western and Central Africa, is uh, identifying ambassadors yeah, from each country which uh, are assigned as ELSC promoters. So this is a person which is visible, in the scientific community, for example, and she could be um, a, a speaker at a large scientific events, uh, could be involved in different activities, uh, which are, have visibility, uh, which goes beyond the scientific community and also as into the wider public. So these people uh, in each country which we have identified, they help us in promoting uh, basic principles of European Open Science Cloud, uh, sharing of the resources, uh, sharing of the data and publications and so on. So um, this is also a very, um, uh, handy action to, to put in place and not very difficult, but to get somebody who really has the, the, the access to the community to be an ambassador. So uh, to summarize these perspectives for the, the region uh, that I see from our point of view, um, so it is important to bring together the Open Science Cloud community in the individual countries yeah? and uh, NRNs indeed can uh, act as focal points here. Um, it is a good step and it does not uh, involve too much uh, effort is to conduct a wide survey to capture the state of the open science in the region. And uh, uh, we have been discussing this uh, maybe even a year ago with our colleagues from Wakran, but uh, this is going to now happen in the Asrin region and I hope uh, also in the, in the Wakran region soon that this kind of survey can be conducted. And then linked to this survey and as more steps forward, we could identify open data sets and repositories uh, in the in the region and work towards uh, fairing them. We can identify cloud-based services accessible on the national, regional, and international level. And then most importantly, we can uh, engage in training, dissemination, and promote promotion of open science cloud principles. And uh, from all these aspects, uh, I think that this initiative that I presented, Mucos Europe, and generally European Open Science Cloud, there's a lot of material, there is a, a, a lot of data that can be used, uh, different approaches, blueprints, and so on. Uh, and I invite the community indeed to have a look at our website, use this material and ask directly us uh, for help and we can share the information uh, regarding this and help uh, uh, Wakran also get on board with these kind of uh, global initiatives. So yeah, thank you very much for your time. I don't think I Excellent. Remember. Thank you very much, Hongan. That was a great overview to, well, to this regional project, but also an insight into EOSC. And I think lots of lessons, as you say, that can be taken and, and used in the Wakran region as well. So the, there was a question in the chat directed to you um, asking about who the stakeholders are. So whether it's NRENs and universities, or if it's also private telco providers. Well, it is the, primarily the, the, let's say, public providers and the, the people who are users, so the, the, the universities, yeah? So at some point, of course, yes, you, can, you could think that telcos could get uh, involved by providing uh, commercial resources on a pay-per-use basis. Uh, but my perspective here always is that the, the national investment building a public uh, open uh, data centers, let's say, for, for the communities, is important in terms of uh, having the know-how in the country and having the know-how in the, let's say, uh, uh, public operators and um, uh, universities and so on. So yes, if you could say that this, these players are involved, but I would say primarily research and education community and those that support it. 
Yeah. And I think in terms of the investment that's happened in all of these EOS projects, it's it's largely, you know, the e-infrastructures, the research infrastructures, it's it's the higher education sector um, that's been supported yeah. to build the European Open Science Cloud. But there is this concept of having a kind of open EOSC exchange or marketplace so that, you know, there are competitive services. So there, there will be the option, you know, to engage different telco providers or Amazon as your storage rather than, you know, local university provision. Um, so one other point I was just going to raise, um, unfortunately, Peggy can't join the session, so we are a little bit ahead of schedule. We won't have to talk from UNESCO. There were a couple of other questions, and I think um, while we're looking at these international perspectives, it might be worth picking up on those because I think there'll be some parallels. So Marcia had also asked in the Q&A, um, she's based in the UK, but she wondered whether they'd be able to access the open research in Japan or whether you have to be part of that network. Um, I don't know, Kazu, if you want to reflect on that. And it's probably a similar question that we could apply to the EOS context as well. Yeah, of course, you know, the research is uh, always happening in terms of the international scheme in uh, uh, or international collaboration. So we have to use, you know, the different, um, the national kind of the, the cloud, each other. So um, in order to do that um, from the viewpoint of the uh, the logging system, so um, it's so hard to explain how to explain easily. So we have a, um, uh, the system um, login to the EOS service by using mm -hmm. my, NII on the login system. So, um, and the vice versa. And not only, you know, the between uh, EOS, uh, European countries and, and Japan. So maybe um, uh, this is, uh, the question is coming from the United Kingdom. So um, and so we call this is the kind of, you know, the interfederation. So, so not only, you know, um, the between the European countries and Japanese country, Japan, uh, Asian country, of course, uh, from the, the African countries, you can, use uh, to our the cloud service of course you know this is also all can be done based on the policy so mm -hmm. um and th there are so many things that we have to uh, talk about or discuss about it on the beyond the continent or beyond the country but basically uh, technically we can do that excellent yeah, I think within the EOS context as well, I mean, this is being built for Europe, but we're very conscious that it's, um, you know, an international initiative and we want to collaborate with partners in different continents um, and the data should be open for all. We have this mantra of as open as possible, as closed as necessary. So it should be available for, for people in, in other areas of the world. And there's another couple of comments, um, one from Mamadou, just about wanting to connect um, with Kazu. And I would encourage everybody, um, the reason we run sessions like this is to, to raise awareness of what's happening in other parts of the world. And Ongan has ended with some great perspectives for the Wakan region. So I think picking up directly with the speakers is a really good way to continue those collaborations. There's also a question from Nabil. Um, hi, Professor Kazu. It's great to see the development on the JP Cloud initiative. What are the global identifiers you're using now to link works and contributions? And what are the challenges you think an institution can face in terms of data exchange and interoperability with different platforms and repository systems used globally? And a final question, we're packing a lot into this one. Will it be connected to the EOSC and other open cloud platforms? So um, and to answer to the, the first question, so um, maybe uh, it's better to say the ORCID. So um, uh, what's the abbreviation of the ORCID? I forgot about it. So Sarah, you remember it? So um, ORCID is, you know, uh, the de facto standard of the researcher's identifier. So um, from the front end, the service we use the ORCID. Of course, internally, so we are using the, you know, the different local identifier or so um, there are several different identifiers to connect each other. But basically, um, um, so the ORCID is a global standard. So maybe uh, we can connect to each other by using the ORCID. And what was the, the, the next uh, question? So, um, so it was about challenges that institutions could face in terms of data exchange and interoperability. 
um, because of the different platforms and repository systems used globally. So, I mean, I, I suspect, I mean, if you're using something like Orchid, it's, it's used in many platforms that will assist in that. Um, yeah. But yeah, generally the data interoperability challenges. So the big challenge is, is the, you know, the ethics or, you know, the human, uh, the blame so itself. Even in, a, in a, uh, the COVID pandemic, um, so there, there's a certain amount of the researchers, they don't want to um, share their research data to, in public. So the culture change is so important, rather than you know, the technical um, interoperability. But uh, I hope um, the fair activity or this kind of you know, advocation um, good, helps change the researcher's mind itself. Excellent. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. The, the technical challenges are, are definitely um, significant, but um, some of these ethical and legal challenges are even harder. There's a question from Richard Pontner in uh, the chat as well, our director Onkin. Um, to what extent is EOS focused on research articles or is it really only about research data? Uh, it, is, it is all actually. It is uh, the data itself, uh, the articles published and also the services that support the, the research uh, life cycle. So yeah, it's all the services that support research life cycle. So the idea is that you have, you can access the, you can access the, the, the data, uh, you can process this data, you can uh, do research on it, you can produce new data and publish it back into the cloud and also publish your publications based on this research back into the cloud. So it's the whole cycle of, of research uh, process. So the answer is yes. Both. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, ah, and I see just in the chat, um, Cambo has said that they don't have any images or sounds anymore. Um, I can still hear. So hopefully that's just like a technical difficulty that's not affecting too many people. Um, I'd maybe <clears throat> check under where it says mute, you can check your own audio settings. I wonder if it's maybe changed to a different output and that's why that's cut. But hopefully, hopefully most people can can still hear the conversation going on. Um, one other question I was maybe going to put just because we have a little bit of extra time here is from an international perspective. So what's going on in EOS, what's going on in Japan and this kind of building of infrastructure and services in, in different continents. What do you think is the main lesson or the main piece of advice you could give to the, the people undertaking the LibSensor initiative and to Wacker and colleagues in the African continent at large? What's the, the major tip that both of you would give? I don't know who wants to go first on that. Um, can I start? This is a set of uh, okay, let's go ahead. No, no, please. So um, as I uh, shown in the growth curve of our repository cloud system. So um, it was our repository activity has been started around 2005. And uh, at the beginning, um, as a NLN, uh, NII, we just di distribute money to the university to build their own repository system by their own effort. However, you know, um, in order to get more scale minute, uh, we've started to provide a cloud service. So, um, Maybe, you know, um, from right, right now, so uh, we are thinking, you know, why don't we uh, start the cloud service from the beginning? So, you know, that, that kind of, you know, the research um, uh, um, infrastructure is a kind of the commodity, is a kind of, it's, there's no competition in terms uh, in the uh, infrastructure. So, um, you know, we can uh, share the infrastructure and on top of that, the university can, um, bring their own uh, characteristics or the researcher can, you know, um, gain some, you know, advantage on top, on top of that. So maybe, you know, um, and there's, and there's a lot of um, different load between uh, that is um, universities and uh, inland. So now is university don't worry about, you know, think about a, to build or to develop the, uh, the infrastructure 
infrastructure by their own efforts, you know. Uh, so maybe we can, you know, um, collaborate each other. And on top of that, the university can play their role. So that's my comment. Excellent, thank you. And Ongan? Yes, I could say second this, that it's very important to have a, a reliable infrastructure uh, services in order to provide the researchers the platform to carry out their research. So you can have different approaches there, more centralized or, or less centralized. Um, the centralized one does work in the sense of uh, you know, logical investment into a platform that is open to all the researchers. So from my other perspective of, uh, of uh, my work in uh, Greek NRN, it is something that was very useful is to, to have these services available to all the researchers, different types of services. But then on the other hand, it's also very important to, to engage the community. Yeah? So it has to be also open. As uh, Sarah mentioned before, this word, uh, uh, you know, as open as possible and as inclusive as possible towards the long tail of science, towards the bigger research experiments also, and engage these people and, uh, and uh, get them to understand uh, the, the, the importance and the benefits to them and to their work uh, of, of uh, open science and uh, the connecting infrastructures and services. So yeah, so it's both, both, both of those things, infrastructure and engagement. Yeah, yeah, I think that engagement piece is really important as well, especially when you have people coming from very different perspectives and backgrounds. Okay, excellent. Well, what I would suggest we move on to next, I know um, Pam Abbott from the University of Sheffield has been working with the LibSensor initiative, and she's going to provide us with an update that will kind of set the scene really for the um, lightning talks that we have from all the different countries. So Pam, do you want to try sharing screen? Hopefully this works. I don't know if you can hear us yet. Yeah. I'm here. Um, Excellent. I'm just trying to see if I can get this working. So share screen, yeah. Yeah. If not, I have your slides. I can always do it if we have any technical issues. This is just loading up. Excellent. That's working. Great. All right, and now let me get to my screen so I can actually present this. Just a second. I think that's it. Okay, so good morning. I'm Pamela Abbott, and I am a senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield, and I've been working with Wachran for the last maybe five years or so on the LibSense initiative. So what I'm going to present today is just a bit of an update on what we have been doing uh, under Africa Connect 3. So, right, excellent, it's working. Um, I'm going to, this is an overview of the entire plan for the four years that we will be working under Africa Connect 3. And uh, basically, there are three tranches of work that uh, have been planned. Year one is mainly concentrating on capacity building, as you can see. Year two uh, is going to shift the focus to policy development. And throughout years one to four, we, we will be looking at infrastructure development. Various stages of this, the planning of it, uh, identifying of um, pilot countries in which to run different types of um, infrastructure pilots and so on and so forth. So there, there will be uh, uh, things or activities taking place between years one to four on that uh, aspect. Um, we sort of look at this uh, plan uh, under the three main pillars of LibSense, capacity building, policy development, and infrastructure development. So for each of these years, something under one of those pillars will be taking place. Throughout the entire program as well, uh, we will be uh, performing some sort of evaluation to see how these activities are influencing the ways in which librarians are able to um, get more support, both institutionally, nationally, um, with regard to training, all of this, uh, for their, the activities that they will be undergoing to support open science and open access in their organizations. So now I'm gonna just talk about what we have been doing in year one. So year one, as I said, is uh, concentrating on the capacity building issues. So this is split up into three kind of tranches. We've got identifying skill sets, the training in the skill sets, and the, that, of course, lead into capacity building. Um, our activities have centered around the um, skills 
profiles development workshops. And um, we have the first one in August 2020, where we took the outputs from the LibSense surveys that we held in 2018, 2019, around the evolving roles of librarians. We took that as input. We also did some research around library and information studies, both um, practice-based and academic-based uh, information, put that together and we developed a webinar uh, around the skills profiles. So basically our librarians told us that they wanted, they thought, they think they need skills in certain areas. So we decided, well, let's, let's get together a set of facilitators from these different regions who are librarians themselves, who understand this area and if, get them to come up with what these skills profiles would be. And they would be, of course, around the digital, around digitization, around open science, those sorts of skill sets. We had that webinar and um, came up with eight role descriptors and the, the whole workshop development process around it. We developed a, a process for doing this. And we also tried to get our attendees to think about how these skills profiles could be tailored to the African higher education environment. Anything above that now, we, we hope that our collaborators and partners will help us, for example, in developing any specific training now for those skill sets, and that the wider LibSense community would see this as part of continuing professional development and on-the-job training that will take place over time. Just to give you an idea of some of the outputs of uh, that um, workshop, we have the entire process, which took around eight weeks. Uh, I call it participatory and co-developed because we work. We have Hello? Sorry, yeah. I, yeah. I got an interruption. Okay. Um, we call it participatory and co-developed because we worked with the um, facilitators from these different regions who were experts in, the, in their different areas and had this, this entire process worked out with them. They helped us to develop the actual skills profiles and help us to um, facilitate the workshop and get the attendees um, contributions. And we even had a bit of post-workshop engagement as well. So you can see some an example of what we were working with. So this kind of skills profiles um, material is what we developed in, co in conjunction with our facilitators, uh, basically pointing out what would be the knowledge, skills, abilities, et cetera, of a particular role. And then within the workshop itself, we asked attendees and facilitators to work together to kind of flesh that out and look at the pros and cons. And in particular, also to look at technical, what would be technical inputs into such a role. Uh, these were the eight descriptors that we came up with. And of these, I think the most common and the most um, well attended ones were scholarly communications librarian and repository manager slash repository administrator. Um, all of the roles, as you can see, are quite supportive of open science and open access initiatives. Um, we also run, run a similar workshop in conjunction with Open Access Week 2020, organized by the Université Virtuelle of Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, and it was a scaled down version of this using the outputs that we got from the August 2020 workshop to help us work on four role descriptors, also using um, facilitators from the Francophone context to try to work with attendees to develop, um, kind of figure out what, what were the weaknesses, issues, et cetera, that they may have with um, these kinds of um, skills profiles and, and developing them and supporting them. That was done in November 2020. And here are some outputs from that uh, webinar. We have representation from uh, Benin, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Burkina Faso and Mali. We receive reports from the facilitators from these different countries on the ongoing projects they have that are developing digital skills for open access and open science. They uh, identified deficiencies in existing problems which were hampering progress with these projects. And they also came up with their own suggestions for how uh, for training activities that they think could address these, these issues. 
the issues, of course, revolved around the same areas that we are concentrating on in this sense, infrastructure, capacity building and policy, and they identified lack of institutional supports for these. The plan out of the Francophone webinar is to actually now to do some targeted uh, Francophone focused skills development webinars in consultation with these facilitators from these countries. And that would be part of our plan going forward. In terms of policy, this is more or less a very broad uh, description of what we plan to do here. So in our second year, the second pillar of policy development will involve awareness um, raising and policy um, development amongst the higher education executive management. And for that, we have a broad uh, idea right now of uh, doing some uh, webinar focused um, policy development workshops. We hope to have outputs of policy guidelines from those workshops, which will then develop into policy briefs. And then at the higher level could up by the um, policy makers at institution and national levels. So again, we are hoping that our collaborators and partners will work with us on helping to deliver these uh, webinar um, uh, sessions. So overall plan for year two, we have been doing this so far in quarter one. We're engaging with IFLA, International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, uh, looking right now at how we can move LibSense beyond non-academic li libraries. So we are talking to them about that. Oh, we're doing the Francophone Skills Development Training Program. We're also doing action plans for open access repository and open access journals. Uh, meeting and coming up with action plans and identifying which countries will be demonstrators. And we are looking at new partnerships as well to help us to deliver these open access repository and RDM uh, demonstrators. For quarter two, we want to concentrate on the um, policy development workshops in conjunction with AAU. We will hold the policy development workshops in quarter three. And then in quarter four, return to the training and capacity development activities that we are planning here in quarter one. Now this, um, for year two, then the focus will be to strengthen those three main pillars I talked about, infrastructure support, policy development, and capacity building. We are focusing, of course, more on the policy development area. We want to strengthen our existing partnerships, as you can see, from this diagram, we have a number of various partnerships that we're working with already, some external collaborators, some African regional organizations, RENS, NRENS, uh, the core foundational team, which uh, consists of Wakran, CORE, IPO, and University of Sheffield, and the links we have with national organizations. So we wish to strengthen those partnerships and also build new ones um, with partners who can help us to deliver on the projects that we are planning for um, under Africa Connect 3. Okay, so basically that is my overview. Just again, a few references for you, a few links to survey outputs that we had in 2018, 2019, and some links to the skills development webinars in August and November of last year. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Pamela. I think that really sets the scene well about what's planned in each year and what work's gone on so far around the skills agenda, identifying what support people need and now moving on to the policy. So we don't have any questions as yet, but we do have a slot for questions after all of the lightning talks as well. So I think what might be best is to go into the lightning talks and then we can have a wider discussion around what's happening in each country and uh, how we coordinate and support that through LibCenter. So Owen, um, if you're happy to share screen and talk about the Nigerian context, that would be great. Excellent, thanks Owen. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, if you just flick it into present mode and then we're good to go. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, hello everyone. And um, it's a pleasure to have this platform. So I thank Wakren for the opportunity to present on the um, National Open Science Roadmap for Nigeria. 
Um, I work for EcoConnect Research and Education Initiative. We're um, an NREN operator in Nigeria. Right. Now, as most of you probably know, Nigeria is the most populous uh, country in Africa. We have over 200 million people and over 500, 550 higher education institutions. So that's a lot of students. It's a lot of uh, researchers, a lot of academics. But when you look at our output in terms of number of um, open access repositories or open access journals that have been published, it is very, um, very tiny. So there's clearly a need for a national open science strategy to increase um, our outputs and have uh, more visibility in terms of uh, research that's uh, being done. And again, this is against the backdrop where um, the peer review process and the uh, cost of publication on proprietary platforms is very prohibitive for researchers. Um, so the idea, as I've been mentioned by some of our previous presenters, is to look within our roadmap to address uh, this through the different pillars of policy, capacity building and um, infrastructure. And when we look at the uh, policy itself, we want to take the work that uh, Libsens have already been doing over the years and uh, take their policy templates as a starting point to engage in consultation meetings towards the development of a national policy document. So within the roadmap, we will be starting off in a quarter two with a series of consultation meetings with identified champions. And um, these would be individuals or institutions that are committed to open access and open science. So we can deliberate with them and then also take our meetings to the national stakeholders. These would include like the federal ministries of education, federal ministry of science and technology, um, and some of the umbrella bodies for higher education, like the um, National Universities Commission and the National Board for Technical Education for Polytechnics, and the, the Research Development Steering Committee of TED Fund, uh, TED Fund being the national funders in Nigeria. So um, uh, in addition to those meetings, we'll basically engage with senior management of uh, higher education, obviously leveraging our contacts as um, an NREN, so that they too can actually see what's being done at the institutional level and see how they can align with this move towards a national policy on open science and open access. So these uh, chief executives would you know, obviously include the vice chancellors and his management team and uh, librarians, senior librarians. Uh, the whole idea of these consultation meetings would accumulate in a workshop, physical workshop that we would hold in Abuja um, in quarter three. Um, and what we would want to do is get some of these stakeholders from these meetings that we've had to kind of consolidate on uh, national policy documents and uh, also look at establishing a number of uh, working groups that can deal with the different areas that uh, need to be addressed in the promotion of open science and open access in the country. So as I've stated, uh, in terms of outcomes, we'll be looking at actually having a national policy document on open science published. And uh, we'll also be looking towards having a clear day planned for the EcoConnect user conference, which we hold annually in January every year. So we'll be looking at having an open day plan for dissemination uh, to the r and &E community in our 2020 users conference. On the capacity building uh, side of things, we've got a series of uh, webinars scheduled to improve the digit digital literacy of our librarians and researchers. We actually know from previous um, previous work, and obviously Pam had touched on um, some of the, the surveys that we've identified that clearly there are skills gaps um, among certainly Nigerian librarians and researchers. So we'd certainly be looking at uh, 
these workshops to address some of that and highlight some of those gaps and continue with the advocacy. And of course, we'll be aligning very much with Libsense with their capacity building uh, activities during the course of, of the year and in subsequent years. Um, and another area we'd like to uh, uh, do within our roadmap is to engage with other stakeholders like tech hubs, uh, women in tech organizations that are focused on building capacity among our youth and women and to sort of uh, ensure that we promote and engage in citizen science. Uh, one of the things that Echo Connect does is uh, we have a, a few programs, our ICT for Girls program, um, our campus technology internship programs, they're geared towards having uh, women and youth engage in projects that use things like Raspberry Pis for projects that can collate and uh, process and publish data. So, you know, those kind of uh, citizen science projects, uh, we want more, more work done in that, that area. Um, and in our roadmap, we'll be looking to uh, kind of uh, step up that activity in the second half of the year. Uh, obviously, uh, our universities have been on industrial strike for a while. Um, and they've only just got back, so we need them to sort of settle settle down and we'll uh, get engaged in those activities in the second half of the year. So the intended outcomes by the end of the year would be to reinforce open science principles and practice within the r and &E community, make the availability of tools and infrastructure kind of just uh, increase that awareness. And again, we'll be, everything will be sort of geared towards our open science day in um, January of 2020 for our user conference. Uh, infrastructure, um, again, through our policy consultations and obviously work that's been done previously, we want to identify and prioritize some of the infrastructure gaps that we, we have and uh, collaborate with the technology providers in the country and outside the country to address the uh, infrastructure deficits. Now, the, the list of those areas is not exhaustive, but these are areas where um, Echo Connect as an NREN um, can certainly um, address some of those uh, infrastructure deficits. So um, we're also looking at having a kind of community-driven open science cloud that will be launched uh, by the middle of the year. And uh, some of the kind of tools that we hope will be available are uh, kind of highlighted in the slide, this slide. Uh, we have our Federation of Identity and Access Management, eduid.ng. So that would allow for trusted and seamless um, access to a number of services that our r &E community would need. And uh, we're in the final stages of deploying a repository based on Invenio RDM. Uh, we're currently working with Coco Foundation, uh, piloting an open source um, um, pub, um, public, uh, publishing platform called uh, Kotahi. And uh, we've done a lot of work, obviously, with uh, Moodle LMS and uh, obviously digital literacy dissemination. We've gone through that platform and interfaces into um, open education resources would be done via uh, our Moodle solutions. Um, so there'll be more information uh, from the links down below uh, with regards to the REN.ng uh, availability, like I said, um, at the end of quarter two. And then that ends my presentation. That was excellent. Thanks very much, Owen. It's great to hear about the extent of the work. There's lots going on. Um, in your plans and, and also good to hear about things like promoting the youth and the females in science and supporting them to engage. Okay, we don't have any direct questions, um, but actually there was one I was wondering about. You mentioned at the start that there's only um, nine journals that are open access. And I wondered as part of, you know, developing the policy and, and developing the infrastructure, whether you've set yourself targets for the growth there, or if you, it's just an increase in general that you want to see in the engagement. Right, well, we're NREN, we're, we're an NREN, so it's not particularly our subject expertise. Yeah. 
with the whole idea would be during those consultation meetings to actually set those kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, goals and uh, see how that would, uh, would work. Yeah, so. excellent. So yeah, to hear from the community what the priorities are, where they want to see the growth, where will have most impact. The agenda, yes. Excellent. Okay. So the next lightning talk comes from Cecile Kulbadi, um, talking about the work in the Ivory Coast. Uh, Cecile, are you able to check? Yeah, okay, excellent. Thank you very much. I don't hear any audio, so just to double check that your audio is working, Cecile. Yeah, I think you're muted, actually, if you just unmute. Okay, do you want to? Okay. Okay, see yes. you now. Okay, bonjour à tous. Je voudrais dire merci. Merci au WACREN qui donne l'opportunité de parler de la science ouverte en Côte d'Ivoire. C'est un plaisir pour nous et une opportunité à saisir en tant que pays sélectionné pour le pilote de la science ouverte. Alors, je dirais que la feuille de route de, de, de la science ouverte en Côte d'Ivoire est déjà, euh, a déjà quelques initiatives. Je note déjà qu'en 2016, il a été lancé le, le projet de la bibliothèque virtuelle de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche scientifique en Côte d'Ivoire. Ce qui nous permet de réaliser un certain nombre d'activités, notamment les activités de, euh, de l'Open Access Week Côte d'Ivoire, et l'Open Access Week Côte d'Ivoire qui ont débuté en 2018 et qui ont été institués par le ministère de l'Enseignement supérieur et de la Recherche scientifique de Côte d'Ivoire. Alors, je dirais tout de suite que la feuille de route que nous présentons sera sous la supervision du ministère de l'Enseignement supérieur et de la Recherche scientifique de Côte d'Ivoire parce que la direction générale, l'université virtuelle à laquelle nous appartenons est une direction générale du ministère et nous travaillerons en étroite collaboration avec le RITER qui est le Rennes Côte d'Ivoire et avec, en étroite collaboration également avec tous les partenaires et toutes les autres institutions académiques et de recherche en Côte d'Ivoire. Pourquoi cette feuille de route? Alors pour nous, c'est un cadre, pour nous, c'est un cadre d'action concertée et formel pour développer la science ouverte en Côte d'Ivoire. Il s'agit pour nous d'accélérer, excusez-moi, d'accélérer et renforcer les initiatives existantes et leur donner plus de visibilité et de valorisation aux activités scientifiques en Côte d'Ivoire. Donc, excusez-moi, le... il s'agit aussi de se conformer aux exigences de nouvelles formes euh, de, de transformation digitale qui en ce moment exigent la maîtrise du numérique. Nous avons tous été euh, confrontés à la COVID et comme par anticipation en Côte d'Ivoire, l'université virtuelle travaillait déjà dans le virtuel pour euh, favoriser le développement de la formation à distance et aussi pour faciliter l'accès à l'information scientifique et technique qui sont des piliers dans le contexte de la science ouverte, la collaboration et le partage. Donc déjà, euh, je crois qu'on a déjà parlé de, de l'activité qui a eu lieu l'année dernière sur le séminaire, euh, la session ouverte sur comment booster la science ouverte et pour nous, c'est l'opportunité à partir de cette feuille de route de booster la science ouverte en, en Côte d'Ivoire par certaines initiatives. OK. Donc, qu qu'est-ce qu que nous allons réaliser réellement au cœur de, notre, de, de cette feuille de route? Nous, les domaines prioritaires pour nous, nous les avons identifiés à trois niveaux. Il s'agit de la promotion, la promotion de la science ouverte 
les activités de promotion de la science ouverte. Il y aura également les activités de, euh, de, de renforcement des capacités qui commencent bien sûr avec une grosse priorité pour la migration de données de la bibliothèque virtuelle de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche scientifique vers la version 3 des Invenio et, en, et la version 3 des Invenio et nous aurons également de nombreuses activités de renforcement de capacité avec des, des réunions en ligne pour véritablement permettre que tout le monde soit au même niveau de, de déploiement de la science ouverte au niveau national. Alors, au niveau de la première activité, qui est le, la promotion de la science ouverte, nous prévoyons une conférence, excusez-moi, je ne sais pas pourquoi, moi, voilà, la promotion de la science ouverte, nous prévoyons euh, une conférence au mois d'avril. Pourquoi cette conférence? C'est pour un peu promouvoir, sensibiliser, sensibiliser euh, toutes les institutions, tous les acteurs à la science ouverte et elle, cette activité va s'appuyer notamment sur, euh, euh, sur euh, le, les recommandations de l'UNESCO qui sont encore faiblement connues et nous pensons que si les gens s'approprient ces recommandations, on parlera plus aisément de politique de science ouverte en Côte d'Ivoire, de politique institutionnelle et de politique nationale. Ensuite, il y aura, nous pensons que pour bien agir, il faut une enquête d'évaluation des besoins qui, que, qui sera lancée. Après la conférence, nous réfléchirons à cette, à cette enquête qui sera lancée pour permettre de recueillir tous les besoins de formation et de renforcement des infrastructures. Ensuite, il y aura, quand nous aurons tous ces besoins, il faut élaborer la stratégie de, la stratégie de développement, de déploiement de la science ouverte, une stratégie nationale, parce qu'il faut tenir compte des besoins de tous les acteurs pour pouvoir être plus opérationnel. Au niveau du renforcement de capacités, donc, cela se trans transpose en plusieurs axes. Il y aura le renforcement des capacités en vue de, de, des infrastructures et puis il y aura le renforcement des capacités pour permettre à toutes les institutions d'avoir, de disposer d'un dépôt institutionnel à partir euh, des mêmes pratiques euh, documentaires pour permettre un peu, les, les, pour faciliter les migrations de données et pour enrichir la plateforme nationale qui existe déjà. Il y aura ça, cette activité étendue jusqu'au mois de septembre-novembre et il y aura également la création de revues en open access parce que en Côte d'Ivoire, la science, les, 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 les articles scientifiques, les publications scientifiques sont faiblement exploitées, ce qui est produit localement. Et nous pensons que créer des revues en sciences ouvertes, renforcer les capacités des scientifiques en ce domaine, aidera à développer la science ouverte. Nous pensons également à, 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 à renforcer les politiques de, institutionnelles de sciences ouvertes. Et ce programme va s'étendre. De, de avril à novembre. La politique, les politiques institutionnelles, nous avions déjà commencé avec les politiques du libre accès et nous allons poursuivre le travail de collaboration avec toutes les autres institutions pour que ces politiques institutionnelles de sciences ouvertes puissent voir le jour au cours de, de, de cette année 2021 et ainsi de suite. Et la, nous aurons l'apothéose avec l'Open Access Week euh, en au mois de novembre 2021. Ensuite, les activités de la science ouverte. OK, les activités de la science ouverte, comme nous l'avons dit, concernent toutes les institutions. Il ne s'agit pas de, 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 de toutes les institutions de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche scientifique, les laboratoires, tous sont concernés et ça va nécessiter la mobilisation de toutes, de tous. Alors, pour, pour, pour nous, il s'agit de, 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 de pouvoir impliquer tout le monde, impacter et réussir. Donc, la mise en place d'une équipe de coordination est nécessaire pour pouvoir sensibiliser, mobiliser tous les acteurs et toutes les parties prenantes à l'accès et les engager dans l'action. Il s'agit également aussi de faciliter l'élaboration. Cette équipe de coordination pourra faciliter l'élaboration 
des stratégies et des politiques institutionnelles pour le déploiement de la science ouverte réellement. Ensuite, cette, cette équipe de coordination aura pour mission d'assurer le suivi et l'évaluation de l'ensemble des activités de la feuille de route. En conclusion, nous disons que la feuille de route, nous souhaitons qu'on puisse l'étendre au-delà de l'année 2021 parce que l'année 2021 n'est qu'une année de lancement des actions concertées en Côte d'Ivoire et il serait souhaitable qu'elles soient étendues à 2021, 2022 et 2023. Voilà en gros ce que la Côte d'Ivoire propose en termes de science ou feuille de route pour la science ouverte en Côte d'Ivoire pour l'année 2021. Je vous remercie. Excellent. Thank you very much for the presentation, Cécile. Um, we do have a hand raised from Emmanuel. Um, Emmanuel, do you want to ask a question? Uh, I don't know if you can unmute. Or if, if not, um, pop, pop it in the Q&A. Um, and just to, to confirm to everybody, we will make the slides available. So apologies that things were kind of jumping on the slides, um, but you, you should hopefully get that content. And we didn't miss any slides. They just um, were you know, kind of reloading. Emmanuel, are you able to unmute? I don't know if I can maybe unmute you if you want to ask a question. No, it doesn't seem I can. Okay. Well, then we'll move on to... La, um, la présentation sera mise à disposition. Et je pense que ça va régler le problème de... Voilà, toutes nos excuses. Merci. Ah, hang on. I now have talking permitted is showing next to Emmanuel, um, but I can't unmute, unmute him. I don't know if you can unmute now, Emmanuel. I'm assuming not. Um, if you would like to pop um, your question in the Q&A or the chat, and then we can, we can pick up on that. Okay, I propose we move on to the next lightning talk um, and we can we can hopefully, um, you know, address those questions afterwards. I see there's one that's coming. Can we get the presentation in, in English? There is an option um, for you to um, the interpretation button at the bottom. You can have it translated as we go along. So hopefully um, you'll be able to, to get that content. Okay, so next up is um, Marguerite Smushi, who's going to speak to us about um, the work that's going on in Tanzania. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks. I think you can see my slides. Let me share my screen. You can see the slides. Uh, yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. It's nice to be here. Thank you, Sarah and uh, Wakran team. I'll be presenting the National Open Science Roadmap for Tanzania. And uh, actually, uh, I think Owen, uh, he puts in uh, a very good uh, why, why the roadmap. Oh. will help us like open up the research, the publications process and things like that. So just to start with uh, Tenet is uh, the Tanzania Education and Research Network and we are, unlike some of the other entrants, we are focused more on higher education and research institutions. It was established in 2008 as a trust. Uh, I, I wanted to go like through uh, quickly about the services we offer, you know, like other entrants, internet is uh, the foundation of all the other services. So we provide that. We provide some uh, range of cloud services. We haven't capitalized much on that area, though uh, most of our members use them for like, you know, offsite backup and things like that. We, we collaborate with uh, Dar es Salaam Institute of Technology for the, to provide HPC 
for researchers who have, and it's, it's open to any researcher from our uh, uh, country. And they, they, most of them have, is from, from the medical industry that they, they use it. We, we also work with uh, our partner that I'll talk uh, later about to provide open repository for higher education and research institutions. And this is a central repository that is linked with all the other institutions' repositories. Yeah, and this many other services, capacity building for the members. We also provide software uh, for the enterprise, but basically for the higher education and research institutions only, Edurom and IDP. There's some of the services that we provide. I mentioned a little bit uh, about the open uh, repository that we are working together with uh, uh, COSTEC. This is Commission for Science and Technology and the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology in Tanzania. We have MOU with them. And we work together to provide the central repository and institutional repositories for uh, tenant members. And this central repository, basically, it contains the metadata for the institutional repository. So it is now uh, operational. Though we need to uh, open uh, more, more access to other institutions. We also have a um, memorandum of understanding with the Consortium for Tanzania University Libraries, and we work with them to provide library systems and also access uh, like with uh, IDP and, and journals uh, as well, and provide e-resources in the, in the libraries. So that's just to give uh, a quick overview in, in regards to open science. But then coming to the roadmap, we have identified uh, five key areas that we think we will focus on uh, in one year from uh, May to April next year. And first of all is about awareness and capacity building. I think Owen put it very well because the open science concept is not uh, very popular and well understood among researchers and librarian students, especially PhD students and policymakers as well, something that we think need to be addressed first before we go into you know, the uh, development of the national open science policy. We, we believe when we raise awareness and sensitize policymakers, it's something that uh, they, they will be easily, they, they will be able to take up and support easily. And we are basically looking to also raise awareness um, uh, through the Tanzania Academy of Science that is well established here in Tanzania. And another avenue we are looking to raise awareness is the International Conference on Digital Transformation that we are hosting in September. Uh, probably most of you have uh, 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 come across that. If not, you can search online Tenet First International Conference on Digital Transformation. I'll also post the link uh, in the uh, chat area so you can you can follow. And, and in this uh, conference, you will have a, a two hour session on open access and digital transformation in research. Um, uh, then we, we plan for the uh, national open science policy development. And um, uh, after the, the policy, we, we also, we're also looking at enhancing the repository that I was talking about, the central repository at COSTEC, that we, because now it is hosted uh, internally, but we want to move it to the cloud and also integrate with the uh, identity uh, service. Uh, basically, it's, it's not like to close it for the uh, for access, but to to open it to more collaborators and and uh, uh, make it accessible to more research community. We're also looking for infra infrastructure and and basically something that we have been discussed is the research idea open database, where uh, where researchers and probably innovators will be able to to uh, share. And, and discuss on the research ideas that are not like research or publication yet, they're just uh, ideas. This one, uh, we believe that it will, it will spark uh, the collaboration aspect and also brainstorming about the possible uh, research that can follow uh, from, the, uh, from the ideas and also improve access to local publications through the uh, consortium of university libraries. 
And lastly, we, we hope to enhance collaboration with other open initiatives around the, the world. We, th this one, you know, from the capacity building workshop, we hope we haven't identified uh, uh, many of those, but you know, the common ones like the Europe one, the Japanese and, and other open science initiative so that we are part of the uh, ecosystem. And this is just a roadmap, a, a quick uh, timeline for, for, from May to April 2022. And I think, uh, and that's, that's the end of my presentation. Sarah, back to you. Excellent, thank you very much, Marguerite. Um, and I think um, what we're seeing through these is a lot of common kind of patterns coming out. So similar work that's happening around things like moving your repository to the cloud and providing these services across all the institutions. So hopefully some of these things can come up in the, the discussion at the end. There had been a couple of questions in the chat um, directed at Cecile. So I'm just gonna take those now um, before we move on to the next talk. There was a question just confirming whether there will be um, a national open science policy in the Ivory Coast, and also whether you've done a mapping of the open science actors. Do you want to speak to those, Cecile? Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. D'entrée, je crois que j'ai dit que ce projet euh, de, euh, de la science ouverte est placé sous la supervision du ministère de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche scientifique de Côte d'Ivoire. Euh, je pourrais donc dire que la cartographie concerne, et je l'ai même dit dans la présentation, elle concerne toutes les institutions de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche scientifique qui travailleront dans le contexte de ce pilote. Merci. Excellent. Thank you for confirming that, Cecile. Okay, so the next presentation is going to be from David Bukenya from uh, Uganda. Oh, Sarah, Sarah. Yes, Marguerite. In the Q and A, there is a question. Ah, I'm okay, sorry, I missed that. I think it's directed to Tanzania, though I don't understand. Uh, ah, okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. I um, let me just take this question first. I uh, <laughs> I have a French English translation because unfortunately I don't speak French. Um, so, what are the challenges Tanzania has encountered in developing an open science policy? Uh, okay, okay, Sarah. Um, I cannot say challenges right now because we have not uh, developed it yet. It is in the uh, plan for this one year roadmap. Okay, yeah, so I think these challenges will emerge and uh, hopefully that's yeah. something that across the network you'll be able to get support from one another. Um, because I, I suspect it will be different in each country what the major challenges are, whether that's engaging certain stakeholders or getting the investment or some of the technical developments. That's true, Sana. Excellent. Thanks, Marguerite. So, David, um, if you want to screen share, we can move on to your talk. Uh, hello. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's afternoon here already in Uganda. I'm David Bukenya. I, I work with the Uganda Christian University, and I also represent the consortium of Uganda University Libraries. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today uh, to present uh, this open science roadmap plan for, um, for Uganda. Uh, in Uganda, what we're looking at really is something pretty, pretty ideal, but basic uh, to start with. And this, uh, this just represents really all the aspects that we're looking to ensure that actually when, it, when we complete this roadmap, hopefully, uh, we'll have all the principles of open science uh, really working uh, um, around uh, our plans for open science. Um, the purpose of this roadmap really is, uh, is just from the backdrop of um, that we have been working uh, quite closely uh, with IFIL uh, and MidSense in promoting open science, uh, sorry, open access. And so uh, we're at a stage where I think we need to be taking the next step to ensure that there's more transparency 
uh, in how science is carried out. So uh, we envisioned that actually uh, this, this roadmap would lead to a much more a wider aspect of appreciating science and taking, taking advantage of it and having more impact and, um, in the country. Um, basically, um, the objective is to have the consortium of Uganda University Libraries uh, in concert with uh, several stakeholders, um, creating uh, some guidelines to uh, uh, working with government, creating recommendations and guidelines to ensure that actually we, we have an open science plan in the country. The, the major context, like I explained earlier, is that um, there's been quite a bit of uh, institutions working with um, open access. Uh, we see libraries as supporting research workflows and so on. And so um, when you talk to sci scientists here, um, you realize that um, there's less appreciation actually of having their, their data, for example, open. So I think openness would be very important for uh, taking the next step to to ensure that actually there is a better, better appreciation of the transparency and um, creating more, more um, open work, um, which we think would, would improve um, uh, how science is uh, seen in the community and how it's handled generally. So um, we want to be working basically with uh, government. Uh, we'll be working with um, some key entities such as the Research Education Network for Uganda. Uh, of course, the central will be many universities there uh, coming in to ensure that actually uh, they up their, their um, open access programs to open science. Uh, we'll be working with the, uh, the National Information and Technology Authority, which already actually has an open data policy. Uh, for the uh, national one, um, so it will be easier to connect with them. And of course, uh, working with LibSense, IFO, and all the other libraries in the consortium. Uh, in a sense, uh, the, the IFO and the LibSense uh, will be very key here in uh, providing a, a good um, a background and uh, a platform for, for capacity building. Uh, the key activities uh, we we hope to start this month to to run business and we'll run like Tanzania to the end of the year. Uh, in this sense, uh, like Nigeria and Tanzania have uh, noted, um, creating awareness would be very important in this case. So um, stakeholder meetings and engagement at the university level, library level, basically um, NREN level. Uh, ministerial level would be very, very important. And also, uh, we hope to run a symposium uh, in about May or June, uh, which, are, which will be at a national level. And this symposium's uh, objective will be to create more awareness, but to make a call for open science in the country. And as that's happening, we'll have talks with the uh, management of several universities, this is very, very specifically, for those that would, we know would be ready to uh, participate in the open science program. Uh, also, uh, we'll be working on policy. Um, it's not yet drawn, so we'll be working on this. Again, working with LibSense and IFO, we hope that we can work out something that would be amenable for the country. Um, then, in a sense, we would want to have uh, recommendations uh, for the Open uh, Science uh, Program in Uganda. Um, and lastly here, uh, for capacity building, we hope that we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll have an e-learning platform that would uh, enable us to create uh, uh, courses that would support the Open uh, Science trainings. Uh, like Nigeria, we're interested in a digital research literacy uh, program. And also, we want to create uh, communities of practice uh, in the universities that will take part so that we can assure continuity of what we build. Uh, also, uh, we'll start setting up the open science uh, infrastructure. 
uh, particularly uh, next month, we'll be identifying what, what is key. And then we'll come up with a plan um, and we'll probably start implementing in the following month. So at the end, uh, we'll want to have a monitoring and evaluation where we'll uh, look to reviewing what we have done, but also particularly looking to, because we know it will just be the beginning, a second phase in the next year. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, David. And uh, completely agree about the importance of engaging the stakeholders so you know that what you're developing meets, meets those needs. I think that's a really important step. Okay, so the next presentation will come from Horatio Zimba, speaking about the work in Mozambique. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. In Mozambique now it's uh, 24 past uh, 12. Oh. Uh, yeah, I think that hopefully we'll put it on full screen mode. Want to try again. Yes, perfect. Thanks, Horatio. So my name is Horacio Zimba, and I'm from Mozambique, uh, University Eduardo Molan uh, in Maputo. Uh, I represent here uh, both uh, the university and I represent uh, the Mozambican Association of uh, Academic Library, Liberian. And uh, I will present uh, our draft of open science uh, roadmap. Uh, these are uh, uh, being uh, uh, done with collaboration of our Minister of Science and Technology through our uh, NREN Moronet. So these are talks I will uh, present uh, today. Uh, I will uh, talk about the background and then uh, I will uh, present the roadmap we have. So as a background, uh, uh, you may know that in Mozambique, the first uh, repository was launched in 2009 uh, as a national repository, but the idea uh, was at that time to have a unique platform in which all institutions could depos deposit their uh, scientific publication. And uh, because of uh, uh, non-existence non of a clear definition of roles, uh, this initiative uh, didn't uh, go ahead. Uh, so uh, in the middle time uh, or in 2012, we start to rethink uh, this initiative. Uh, but uh, uh, in the same time, some, uh, some uh, universities deployed their uh, institutional repository. Uh, in, this in, in this time, uh, I'm talking now, only two are registered in the open door uh, 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 directory. So about the open access journals in Mozambique, we have some uh, that are deployed uh, uh, in 2012, the first one at the University of Duarte uh, And uh, year, year after that, uh, some other university uh, launched their uh, uh, open access journals. But still uh, a few uh, initiatives in, in, in the country, so uh, main activity uh, on this initiative are being done by University Eduardo Mondan. Uh, we uh, we organize some events on uh, open access uh, within the country uh, with uh, uh, with collaboration. Our partner from uh, Portuguese country speaker, uh, Brazil and Portugal. We followed uh, the conference called uh, Conferencia Luz of Brasileira Mozambique, uh, the Assessor Bert, uh, that we have been followed, 
following uh, since 2012 and uh, we we are trying to bring this conference to Mozambique was supposed to uh, be organized this year uh, in uh, our country but because of the pandemic situation was was to 2022 we have some uh, seminar, we had some seminar at, at 2016 and 2019, uh, where we discuss uh, uh, some issue uh, in uh, capacity building uh, and uh, uh, police institution, uh, national police and but those uh, events was to uh, uh, promote and uh, to have uh, to bring awareness for our stakeholders in Mozambique because uh, till now we don't have a, a, any police uh, 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 deployed in the country. And our NREN Murnet uh, since 2018 organized one uh, annual uh, conference on which we uh, usually have one panel that uh, uh, talk about open access and open science uh, in the country. And usually we uh, invite our uh, uh, colleague from uh, uh, Brazil and Portugal to uh, 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 present their experience for our audience. So, the roadmap we uh, we are drawing now uh, still a draft, but we uh, will focus on uh, uh, institu institutional repository that are now being uh, restructured. Uh, uh, as as you know, we have uh, this repository called uh, repository Sabe. And in this moment, uh, our NREN uh, are working on uh, a new, a new uh, installation that will be presented in the conference in April 26, 2007, so next month. So in this uh, 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 conference, we'll present uh, the idea we have uh, now because we need, uh, we, we are, we are we are, we are thinking that many of our institution in Mozambique don't have uh, uh, their repository because they are facing the difficulties uh, on uh, uh, capacity building and in infrastructure. So the NRN will be uh, the support on uh, uh, building the infrastructure and uh, each uh, institution will be uh, uh, a community in the uh, common repository that we will uh, present in the, this conference. And in the same time, we are, we are thinking on a uh, uh, national repository that will be a, an aggregator to uh, bring uh, uh, on, on track all other uh, repositories that are uh, deployed by uh, each institution uh, in, in, in the county. And the second uh, 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 focus uh, on uh, this roadmap will be uh, the discuss on uh, policies uh, in national level. We think that uh, will be uh, very important to uh, engage the Minister of Higher Education uh, and, and the Minister of Science and Technology and Higher Education uh, and uh, our Association of Academic and Research Library uh, on this uh, uh, discussion and all other stakeholders uh, uh, that uh, 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 we have now uh, identified our uh, university, uh, uh, research institutions, and other uh, stakeholders that uh, will be very important to uh, uh, bring uh, this uh, new uh, 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 view of doing research in, in the world. So these are two uh, uh, 
uh, activity that we think that on this first uh, year we will will be uh, uh, good to uh, do in Mozambique. So uh, the, as I mentioned, in this uh, year we will present, uh, uh, we have one panel on uh, annual conference and we'll discuss these issues. And uh, we think uh, that maybe it will be uh, important to, to uh, uh, introduce in the count, in the uh, academic calendar, the open access week. Uh, uh, we think that will, uh, this activity can, can be done uh, uh, in this year, in October. And uh, uh, this week will be uh, organized by the means of science and technology and replicate, replicated in each uh, high education institution within the country. So in this week, uh, we will do uh, a different workshop uh, to uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, the uh, science, uh, uh, the open science uh, policy and to build uh, a consensus on it uh, and which action we uh, should uh, 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 do uh, to uh, bring all stakeholders on uh, uh, on the roads. So this is my presentation, and thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Horatio. And yeah, definitely a good idea to use Open Access Week. I see Irina's put the link in the chat there, but that's going to really build momentum. So it's a good time for engagement. Excellent. So we have one final talk from Marguerite Grafer, um, looking at the lessons that have been learned in, in the Ethiopian context. So good afternoon. I try to share my screen Excellent. here, my presentation. Okay. Yeah, my name is Margaret Freire. I'm posted in Ethiopia. I'm working with the Higher Education Strategy Center in Addis Ababa. And um, I have been with the National Academic Digital Repository of Ethiopia from the very beginning, together with Professor Roberto Barbera from the University Catania. Uh, something is moving now, what should not? Okay. okay. Um, I would like to present here the, the lessons learned and thank you very much for inviting us here to, to show our approach and where we are right now. And uh, I have to say it's a very dynamic uh, process and uh, by far we are not at the end. You will then see later on. Um, how it comes that we started with the National Academic um, Digital Repository of Ethiopia. First of all, uh, from the ministry, all university in Ethiopia were invited to start with their institutional repositories. And our idea was then to come in with the National Academic Digital Repository and to harvest from the institutional repository. But um, it did not really work out like that. And um, now the National um, Academic Digital Repository in brief, the NADRE, is also used as uh, institutional repository by many universities. What was uh, the initial idea to have um, a, a repository? This was, first of all, the visibility of Ethiopian uh, research outputs, then also the access to international research outputs. Then, first of all, I should have said the fight against plagiarism. This is a very, very huge topic here. And um, they thought they really can uh, come up with the repositories, the institutional repositories that they can um, bring plagiarism to a halt. Uh, then, or at least to make it uh, transparent. And then, of course, uh, to secure the ownership of uh, research outputs. This is also a, a very important topic, what uh, is not um, finalized yet, but at least we could uh, uh, bring here in the digital. Uh, object identifiers and with that many researchers are convinced that their ownership is secured. 
Dann. Um, of course, first of all, it was the visibility what we wanted to achieve. This was the easiest way or somehow relatively easy way to achieve the visibility of Ethiopian research outputs because we, we could register in different open access repositories. Now uh, we are registered in five. And another point uh, was then that we can come up with the national open access repository. It moves by itself. I think if you jump back, hopefully it will stop doing that auto advance. So, uh, with the national open access uh, policy of Ethiopia for higher education. And this was uh, quite something. And uh, I think this uh, really brought them the boost to, to the NADRI. Um, in, in the map here, you see all the Ethiopian universities. We have now 50, around 50 universities, all have access to the, uh, to the NADRE and can use NADRE as institutional repository. And then um, Ethernet is the, uh, more or less um, the technical advisor and um, is doing all the engineering work. They uh, coordinate then with the universities. Now, what have we learned so far? As long as it was a project, we, we have here the project proposal, then we have uh, implemented the project, all was fine, and we had our guidelines. We had our guidelines, we followed the, uh, the proposal. Everyone was very excited about uh, the NADRE. And Maybe I leave it like that. I don't go for the for the mode. And at the end, it it was that somehow it stuck. Everything was done. Project was finalized. Uh, there was a very nice handover, and now it's with the universities. They use they should use it. Of course, they use it, and we see that they use it. That we have now more than ten thousand artifacts, uh, documents, and databases, and. Uh, and the presentations on, on the NADRE, that means somehow it works. But of course, it doesn't work in the way as it was thought at the beginning, because the, this is a project. And once the project is done, then it goes into the daily routine. It becomes a department uh, of a university or a directorate, and then it will be managed. But um, the tasks are overwhelming for the, for the staff, for the academic staff or for the administrative staff at uh, the universities. I say academic staff because many librarians are also lecturers and they are rather in the lecturing activities than in the managing activities. And of course, they are not really trained for the management. And this we haven't done also in the in the project implementation. It was not the managerial training, it was rather the training um, how to use then the, uh, the repository, how to, yeah, the data management plan was also quite uh, a training, then data stewardship training we have done. That means how to use the tools uh, available uh, from NADRE, but not how to manage NADRE by itself. And now we are at the point that we are saying we need a business-like approach for NADRE. What does it mean? Where should we start? First of all, with the strategic plan, what we have to have. Then, of course, with the job descriptions. We cannot expect that the librarian will do the administration of NADRE. That means the overall administration. It's much, much more than the administration of the repository. It's also... It's a, it's a department, it's a directorate. Then of course the recruitment. We have to recruit the people appropriate to the job descriptions. And then of course the training in management, leadership and communication. And here we are right now, it's quite a long way to go, but at least it's something people are convinced that it's worthwhile to have the NADRA and they start working. 
Of course, we still work also on the open access uh, policy. We still work the, the paper we have, but how to implement this in, at uh, university level. And then, of course, um, on um, open data. This is the very crucial point where we have then to focus on as well. So this is so far what we have done. Our experience, please feel free to contact uh, Professor Roberto for the technical part or you contact me if you need any further information. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marguerite. And it's great to see the uptake you've had of NADRA. But as you say, the challenges of then continuing to sustain a service and to operate it, it's quite different to that project phase. So we have a few minutes left before the hour. I just wanted to see if anyone wanted to raise any questions um, to the various lightning talk presenters looking at the lessons that have come out or the work that's going to be happening in these pilots. See something's come up in Q&A. Uh, is NADRA a collaboration with the universities? Yes, definitely. Um, it, NADRA comes from the ministry and from the Ethiopian uh, Research and Education Network. And all universities, all public universities are already partner from NADRA. Private universities can participate, but then they have to pay. Therefore, we uh, don't have private uh, universities in NADRA right now. Okay, I might have mistranslated that. Um, how many <laughs> universities does NADRA work with? <laughs> Sorry, I should have used my Google Translate rather than trying to do it on the fly. Is it uh, all the universities in the yes, Ethiopia? All the, public, all, all the public universities are on board. We have now around uh, 50 universities and all of them. And now the discussion is also to reach out to TVET. That okay. TVET colleges also can become uh, partners in NADRA. Excellent. So, so one question I would maybe ask to um, all of the Lightning Talk presenters, you've all pitched out your roadmap, what you're going to be doing over the coming years, um, speaking about, you know, the engagement you have around the policy and, you know, how you're trying to get different champions and supporters to, to back that, but then also about some of your infrastructure building, things like the repositories that you have in place. And I wondered if, if any of you want to reflect on what your major concerns are, um, you know, in implementing your roadmaps. Are there particular aspects that you suspect are going to be a bigger challenge or that you might need more support from LibSensor on, whether that's capacity building or the infrastructure or the policy side? I don't know if any of you would like to give a reflection on that, what you think will be the biggest concern in terms of implementation. Yeah, Sarah, <coughs> if you uh, yeah. allow me to go. Uh, yeah, of course. To us, the biggest concern is uh, copyright issues. You know, mm -hmm. anytime you bring uh, the issue about open access, it's it, it, then the copyright issue pops up as well. Yeah, and I think this is part of I don't know, awareness and policy. Of course, I think that that's where we see a challenge there. But we hope awareness and policy will probably help. Yeah, and there's an agreement from Marzia in the UK about copyright being a major issue. And actually, this is you know something that Pazu had picked up on before about legal and ethical challenges. It's not really only the technology. Any other reflections others would like to make about the aspects that you think might be most concerning over the next couple of years? Yes, uh, David here from Uganda. My, my yeah. thinking is the, uh, the change of mindset, really. Um, because already while implementing open access, we had several Oy. issues just getting our researchers having their work open. open. So mm -hmm. now imagine you have to go the, net, the extra mile to, to have your entire <laughs> research <laughs> process, have your entire research process open. Yeah. So we think, we think the culture change or the mindset will be in a problem here as well. And it just might take a little longer convincing, getting to convince uh, stakeholders to participate more fully. 
Thank yes, you. no, I, com I completely agree with that. Um, I think certainly on the data side as well, it's a much more challenging question. You know, it's it's not as easy to to make things available as, you know, as uh, as with publications, which, you know, is a more homogenous format and a bit easier, I think, for researchers to follow the processes. So I see another question in uh, the Q&A. Um, what were the difficulties that Nadra encountered? Marguerite, would you like to speak to that? Yes, a very interesting question. And I think uh, this also goes then to that what is mentioned before with the, um, with the copyrights. It was from the very beginning, the copyright issue that has somehow blocked us um, for, for starting Nadra to roll out from the very beginning. That means uh, once we had done the policy, it worked nicely, but before we had many discussions and um, it helped us so much to have then the um, uh, digital object identifiers. And with that, we could convince um, more or less everyone that the ownership is not taken and no one will steal. And, um, and if they steal, it's very transparent and uh, the blame is then yeah, in, in the public sphere to the uh, people who have stolen. Um, and I think this worked quite a lot. But of course, the, the data issue we have still, we, it's difficult to get the thesis with the databases. They publish the thesis, but the databases are not, not published. Mm -hmm. It has different reasons, but... Um, I think this is also a work then an academic work that we have to work on data on reliability of data. Um, yeah, and so this is also the discussion is NADRE um, or is following NADRE the fair principles. Of course, we try to, but if it comes to open data, then we have to say no. Mm -hmm. Right now, not. That means this uh, needs much more effort from all sides, from the ministry side, from, from academia and from the individual researcher. Yeah, yeah, to make sure everything's fully documented and appropriately licensed. There were a couple of other questions about copyright, which I hope have been clarified by that interjection um, from Marguerite. So, I mean, I, I guess the issue here is being clear about the ownership of the data, having a clear license so that you can then assert um, the copyright and, and what conditions others can use it under. I'm conscious of the time and I think there may be another session from 12, so we should wrap this up. So I'd like to just extend a huge thanks to all the speakers of the session and to the organizers of the conference. Um, I would encourage you to follow up to look at what's happening through the LibSensor work on those open science roadmaps and also to collaborate internationally and learn lessons that you can from EOSC and, and from others like in Japan. So thank you all very much and have a lovely afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Sarah. Thank you. Bye -bye,